evening. Thanks. Thank you for that very warm welcome. Hi, my name is Subhadra, and I am a historian of science and a museum curator down the road at UCL. You might know us, University College London. Oh. <laughs> that wasn't really what I was going for, but yeah, the keep, keep the enthusiasm up. More for me, less for the organisation. And um, so one of the collections I curate is a thing called the Galton Collection. Oh. Uh, <laughs> which... <laughs> Thanks for killing the punchline, well done. Uh, which is the collection of Sir Francis Galton, who I will put to you is the most important Victorian scientist you have never heard of. Now, I'm aware you guys are very clever and a very sciencey audience, so it's entirely possible that you have heard of him. Most of the people who know me have heard of him because I'm always going on about him. Um, but the general point I'm trying to make is that we don't talk about this man as much as we should. Um, which on the surface of it is kind of unusual. He is a very important and influential scientist. The work he did very much affects our lives nowadays. Um, he started out actually as an African explorer. Um, that was how he gained his fame. So if you think, if, if someone said to you the words Victorian African explorer, you know that picture you get in your head of a, like a, an old white guy in a white suit with a pith helmet with like an acquisitive gleam in his eye? That's that picture. You think it's Stanley and Livingston. It's not. It's Galton. It's based on a book that he wrote called The Art of Travel, which is still in print, originally published in 1855. Um, he went off on these African explorations, he came back, wrote this book, kind of became the Bear Grylls of Victorian London, and having established himself as such, went on to do a lot of interesting science. I'm going to give you three examples um, of things that very much affect our lives now, and the first of them is that most English of subjects to talk about, which is, of course, the weather. Now, if you watch the weather forecast first thing in the morning, like any sensible person, um, you can thank Francis Galton for that because he is the first person to turn weather data into a visual map. Um, for centuries, uh, what people used to do when they wanted to know what the weather was was that they either looked up or they went outside and looked up. <laughs> and what Galton did was he said, let's look at this scientifically. We like that, right? Science show, we like people who say, let's look at things scientifically, yeah? And he, was, he looked at much wider range of data from the, across the whole of Europe. He started to draw lines between areas of equal barometric and temperature, uh, barometric pressure and temperature. Um, and so today, the fact that you know you had to put on a raincoat to come out, you can thank Francis Galton for that. The se thank you very much. Yes, I'll pass that on. Um, <laughs> the well, like this, you know, uh, me and Frank. So uh, the second thing, again, very, very topic that's close to the English heart, which is tea. Okay. Now, thank you. Let's go. It's all sausages and tea and all kind of food related stuff with you, isn't it, my darling? Okay. Um, so, uh, for centuries, um, people had been putting the leaf of the camellia tree into boiling water with really little thought as to what the optimal product of that was going to be. And what Francis Galton did was said, let's look at this scientifically. <laughs> and in doing so, what he did was he came up with the mathematical formula for the perfect cup of tea. Now that gets a lot more respect in this room than it normally gets in other rooms. <laughs> because what you have appreciated that a lot of non sciencey people don't get is that that is an algorithm, okay? So if you have ever bought a cup of tea or coffee from an automatic machine that dispenses these things, I'm very sorry for you. <laughs> but, but it's important to remember that that way of thinking, this idea that we can break these things down into their constituent parts and use maths to make our lives better, we have Francis Galton to thank for that. The third thing, um, is uh, probably a subject that's quite close to your heart, or not, depending on how you describe it, is atheism. Uh, Galton was one of the very first popular, yeah, woo for the thing that doesn't exist, yeah. Uh, <laughs> was one of the very first popular atheists. In fact, he wrote a mathematical paper statistically disproving the power of prayer. Okay. <laughs> so the, the, the basic principle was, um, I've just realized I haven't got a timer here, guys. You're gonna have to stop me when you just tell me, okay? Uh, so uh, what, he, what he did was he said, let's imagine, let's think about this scientifically, <laughs> is, uh, okay, so the people that you would expect, uh, if prayer did work, then the people who get prayed for the most should have the longest lives. The people that get prayed for the most are royalty because they, the king or the queen or whoever it is gets prayed for in little local churches and you raise a glass and you say, God save the king, etc." Um, so you would expect them to have a longer life expectancy than other members of the nobility uh, who have the same amount of money but are not getting prayed, prayed for. Those are your variables, those are your con the constituent bits, that's what happens. Uh, and he gathered the data and he was able to work out that this was exactly the opposite case. Uh, 
So not allowing for either assassination or accidental death, these are occupational hazards. Um, <laughs> but if you, if you take that, those numbers into consideration, the people who are being prayed for the most actually don't last as long as the ones who aren't being pray, prayed for. There is no God, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And again, I will pass that on. Now, uh, good guy, right? You happy with this guy so far? Is this working out for you? Because this is a really, like all of those things I have admittedly kind of dragged you along with me in terms of understanding how positive his contribution is. You cannot argue that he is an uninfluential figure, okay? He did other things, uh, fingerprinting. He's the first person to demonstrate that the odds of two people having the same fingerprints is one in 64 billion. That's the basis of our criminal identification system. Um, but then he did this other thing, yeah? Uh, which, 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 is the, um, which is the eugenics. So, yeah. Now, um, Francis Galton's first cousin, they shared a grandfather, was a guy you probably have heard of uh, in science circles. His name was Charles Darwin. Can I get an amen for Charles Darwin? Yeah, you, no one, you really shouldn't have followed me on that one because that's a very church thing to do. Don't do that. Um, Darwin published his book on the origin of species outlining, uh, by natural selection, outlining the mechanism whereby he understood species to evolve. Um, and Galton's particular genius when it came to looking at this idea was he said, for centuries, people have been having sex with little or no thought as to coming up with the optimal output of that process. <laughs> Let's think about this scientifically. <laughs> And if we were to do that, what we would realize is that there is the potential for cultural selection, let alone, actually not even that, scientific selection. If we can work out what those traits are that we think to be the most positive, we can encourage the people who have those traits to have children, and society will march on into the great blue beyond into a brave new world where everything will be much more brilliant and everyone will be more athletic, better looking, um, uh, smarter, I guess. Um, <laughs> all those all those other things that we think are good, which is a phenomenally, you have to admit the appeal of this idea, okay? If you either A, have children, work in formal education, or have traveled on the tube at rush hour, you will have had thoughts about who should and shouldn't be allowed to have children. So, it, so don't pretend like this doesn't have appeal. But then, and actually, uh, if we went back to London a hundred years ago from now, all of us progressive type people who would be hanging out in pubs like this, admittedly not this pub, maybe slightly further down, Bloomsbury, Fitzrovia, kind of a pub, we're talking about the, the prog more progressive places. They thought that eugenics was gonna be the solution that was going to save the British Empire, great thing that that was, um, and improve the race, and we would move forward, and this would be a good thing. Someone else thought that was a great idea. His name was Adolf Hitler. Um, that's a whole other nine minute set. Um, you might want to stop laughing at this point, which is that the, what the Nazis did in the pursuit of racial purity in their eugenic state as they saw it is the natural converse of Galton's idea. If you pick the positive ideas and encourage those people to have children, the natural opposite is that those people who have the traits you think are negative should be wiped out. Now, in the interest of fairness, it's important to point out that the United States had sterilization laws that were happening while Galton was still alive, okay? And he died in 1911. So the Nazis are a good few decades in the future, as far as that's concerned. Now, eugenics did not stop at the end of the Second World War. It was carried on as a program primarily in Britain in the form of the birth control movement. Um, so, uh, Mary Stopes, is a name that will probably ring bells with you. If you're female and you are on the pill, you should know her name. She is important, she is good. She was a eugenicist. And the reason she was interested in who was having babies was she was interested in who should be stopped from having babies, which was poor people as far as she was concerned. The, the, the policy of the British government was that it was gonna be the black and brown people um, whose populations in the aftermath of the Second World War were growing. This was gonna be a concern for an empire that was crumbling at that point in time. Um, those programs were enacted uh, in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Japan, in India as recently as 1976, which is four years before I was born. Um, Mrs. Gandhi, uh, who was our prime minister at the time, signed a program which was for voluntary sterilization in uh, exchange for aid. Um, don't know how voluntary you think that is. Not very voluntary, okay? The whole being alive thing is kind of constituent in whether you have free choice or not. Now, 
I'm not suggesting that all scientists should need to have some kind of Oppenheimer moment about this and decide that they're never going to carry this on. But what I am suggesting is the fact that we don't talk about Galton and we don't talk about race and we don't talk about the science of race is helping the racism to continue. Um, now, again, that's a whole other nine minute set. You're going to have to take my word for it. Racism is a thing that exists. <laughs> Thank you for coming along with me on that one. I wasn't entirely sure. So, but this is the point that I'm trying to get across to you is that if we're going to be good scientists, if we're going to be good communicators of the history of science, scientists, you're going to have to get us historians in there and we're going to have to have a little party, ideally not to make babies. That's a metaphor that I've extended beyond how I wanted to take it. Um, and in order to kind of demonstrate the seriousness of this and being aware that I may or may not have any time left whatsoever, um, I would like you to demonstrate to both yourselves and to the rest of the universe um, that this is a, an important subject that you would want to carry on. Um, now, there is no pressure for you to do this, but I would suggest one way of doing that, as I were to leave the stage, would be for you to send me off to a standing ovation. <laughs> Demonstrating your commitment to this process. Now, if there are any Radio 4 commissioners, I am available. I've grown the accent especially for you. I can do all of this kind of thing. It is happening. Um, and thank Thank you very much for your attention and also for your encouragement with this process. The fight goes on. Thank you. <laughs>